Good evening. Welcome to Lawyers on the Line. Tonight we're talking about estate planning, which may feel a bit overwhelming, but these days even your primary care physician wants to know if you have a will. So welcome to Lawyers on the Line. I'm Sean Quinn, a partner at Falsani, Balmer, Peterson and & Quinn, and this evening's moderator. I'm pleased to welcome our panelists, Jenny Carey of the Hamfreedy Law Firm and Mark Signorelli of the law firm of Mark T. Signorelli Limited. We're ready for your questions. Call the numbers at the bottom of the screen, 218-788-2844, or toll free at 1-877-307-8762. And now on to tonight's topic. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, estate planning. I could say, what's estate planning? And you could each have 15 minutes and I can just sit here. But uh, simply, it, you know, maybe 30 seconds, what's estate planning, Jenny? <laughs> I think estate planning means getting your affairs in order, primarily for providing for the transfer of your assets and who will be making those decisions upon your death. So usually it's going to involve making a will, having a power of attorney, probably a health care directive, and depending on the complexity of your estate or the amount of money that you have, trust as well. Okay. Um, Mark, uh, follow up on that. What, what are these various items? You know, we'll start with a will. What is a will? Well, a will is a written instrument signed by you, dated and signed by you in the presence of two witnesses. That's all that's required. And the answer to the question is, can you write your own will? The answer is yes. As long as you have the two witnesses? Yes. Okay. And the will okay. says, I'm giving my stuff to whoever I'm giving it to? Yes. Okay. So then what's a power of attorney? What's that for, Jenny? A power of attorney, usually called a durable power of attorney, means that you are giving someone else the authority to make um, financial and property decisions for you. Typically in the estate planning arena, we use it to plan for the event of incompetency or incapacity because without that, no one else has the right to make those decisions for you. Um, many people think that if they are married, the spouse automatically has that right, but that's not the case. The spouse does have um, authority to access joint accounts, for example, um, but does not automatically have the ability to access, for example, my bank account if I'm unable to do so. So a power of attorney is a short written document um, that does um, come with its advantages and disadvantages because it's a very broad, powerful document, but it can be a very important tool in the estate planning toolbox. And the idea being before you become incapacitated, you give somebody that right in the event that it happens. Right, because for example, if you don't do that, um, your only recourse, it's, it's not that you don't have recourse, but then you'd be required to go to court under most circumstances to obtain a conservatorship over the person's assets. And then there could be fights over that. Or, or at least mm -hmm. additional cost, okay. yes. All right, so Mark, one of the things that Jenny mentioned as part of an estate plan are trusts. And I understand that's a whole topic in and of itself. There are revocable trusts, irrevocable trusts. I think there's something called a living trust or something like that. Give us an idea of what trusts are. A trust is a contract, unlike a will, which is a unilateral writing. A trust is a contract between the maker of the trust and the trustee. Now, oddly, smoke and mirrors, you can be your own trustee while you are alive. And that's a living trust. They became popular as a way to avoid probate in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Still are, because you stay out of court. You stay out of probate. You're constrained only by the time it takes for you to wind up the affairs of the trust and then move on. And what does a trust accomplish? The will is already accomplishing giving your stuff to so many people. What well, the, the, trust accomplish? the will may not be necessary if your assets are either in the trust to begin with or passed to the trust by beneficiary designation at the time you die. In short, you may have a very pretty will, okay. but and it never heads to the probate court and means nothing. Okay. So Jenny Marks mentioned probate. What's probate? 
Probate is a process to administer your estate, the assets in, in your estate after death. But it certainly is a term that many people ask about because there is a difference between what probate assets are and what non-probate assets are. So for example, when you make a will, a will is only going to govern your probate assets. And what is that? Those are assets that you have titled in your name alone. They do not have a joint um, owner on an account. They do not have a beneficiary designation. And because upon your death, there is no one with legal authority to transfer your assets, the probate or the administration by the court system of the estate is necessary to transfer those assets. Okay. So if you handle your estate properly and make sure things are either non-probatable or otherwise handled by the will, you never go to court? Correct. Okay. Now, Mark, uh, Jenny mentioned non-probatable things, things like that have beneficiaries or things that are not solely in your name. So if you're married and you own your house with your spouse, that's not a probate asset. Is that basically right? If it is owned as joint tenants. Okay. And that's typically what most spouses do, correct? Yes. Although okay. some people think they have it that way, and then the lawyer looks at the deed and lo and behold, it isn't. That way. <laughs> And that's a total separate issue, I suppose. Yes. So, and then life insurance policies, because there's beneficiaries, non-probate. Non-probate. Okay. Um, so, uh, somebody uh, writes a question here. Um, is there a place, maybe online, where a person could check to see what can be done as far as the sale of a home prior to death or after death? Or is that something you'd rather want to see an attorney about? I guess if the question is, what can I do to transfer my home at the time of my death? Okay, so I'm making some assumptions about that question. Um, there is tons of information online, and sometimes that's the problem. Because if you do not know what information is reliable and what information is unreliable, you're going to have trouble sifting through the information. And the other um, important factor is that online, you're going to get uh, advice from across the country. And you need, if you live in Win uh, Wisconsin, you need to know Wisconsin law. If you live in Minnesota, you need to know what the Minnesota law is. So I, Mark, do you have one site that might be helpful. I don't, um, with respect to the sale of the house, I don't know that I can come up I, with one I off really the top don't. of my head. Okay. And just because something's online, you've already alluded to it, doesn't mean right. that it's accurate. Mm -hmm. All right, Mark, uh, one of, again, going back to the Jenny's very first answer, she mentioned health care directives. Yes. And we've already talked about power of attorney where somebody has the right to deal with your assets, but that doesn't mean dealing with your health or your health um, care, correct? Someone to speak for you if you're unable to speak for yourself. And, and that's it, what this health care directive is? It names so. a health care agent or one or two of them and normally you, or you would give one to your physician or enroll one in the hospital records so they have something on file and it can be very long, it can be very short and sweet. You're naming a health care agent and then a backup agent to make these decisions if I can't for myself. Okay, and, the, and when you say they can be very long or very short, you, can you limit them to only in this certain circumstance or that circumstance? Oh yes, you can do that too, but the, some of the pre-printed ones I've seen from healthcare systems are long and eye-crossing, whereas you can edit your own um, or have someone edit it for you and make it Simple, short, sweet, to the point, and very powerful. Okay. Now, uh, one of the callers asked about any special tips on a health care directive, and I'm going to short circuit that question because of the previous question regarding, you know, looking online about selling a house. I know I'm biased as an attorney myself, but in the long run, aren't you saving money by seeing an attorney on these types of issues? whether it be a health care directive or a power of attorney or a will or a trust or whatever it may be? I think in most cases, um, 
the saving the money part comes from without going to see a lawyer, you can give it a good shot. The question is whether you're doing it right is a really big question mark in almost all cases. I think that the healthcare directive is probably the document that comes, um, at least in my opinion, closest to somebody being able to do themselves without seeing a lawyer because it involves so many personal decisions with respect to someone's health care. Let me put a plug in for graduation season. <laughs> Parents and grandparents might find a proper gift for their now 18-year-old graduate to get him or her a health care directive and a power of attorney because they may be post high school moving around the country and maybe abroad. Okay, so for your graduation gift, you get an hour with Mr. Signorelli or Ms. Carey, that kind of thing. Good idea. All right, so we have a caller. Um, power of attorney regarding an older brother who has a TBI, traumatic brain injury. Uh, if he were to die with cash assets, would the brother-in-law, who's on the joint checking account, be in charge of the assets, presumably the cash? If... Well, first of all, keep in mind that a power of attorney is valid during the person's lifetime and a power of attorney expires or terminates upon the person's death. So part one of that question regarding who would be in control upon death, the whoever served as the attorney in fact or the agent under the power of attorney has no more authority after death. However, the question of who would be in charge of the money in that joint bank account that had a joint owner, that other owner becomes the owner of 100% of that money and would be in sole control. Okay, so in that circumstance, a brother-in-law who's a joint owner of a checking account, when the person with the TBI dies, now that person is the sole owner of that checking That's account. That's right. Yes. Okay. So another caller, um, can a will be contested by a potential heir in probate court? And then the caller goes on to say, especially if the deceased was incompetent at death. Now that's at death versus at mm -hmm. the time of the will, so. In some jurisdictions, there is a pre-probate of a will available. While you're still alive, your kids will pre-probate your will. You might decide later on and with full competency I'm changing my will. So the pre-probate was just a large waste of time. Okay. Now the, the person is perfectly uh, with the, all their wits about them. They do a will. Slowly they deteriorate, become incompetent, but don't make any changes. They die. Mm -hmm. A potential heir is left out. Can that person challenge the will? I think when you talk about a lawsuit, almost anybody can sue anybody for almost any reason. So the question is, will they be successful? Um, yes, there might be standing questions, but let's say you have an heir who was omitted from the will, which I think is what the caller's talking about. Sure. So they would be a person who would otherwise have an interest in the estate. So from that perspective, they would have a right to challenge the will. But in order to do so successfully, they have to prove that that person um, lacked the proper um, state of mind to execute a will or was- When they executed. When they executed, yes. not upon their death, okay. um, or that they were not unduly influenced. Mm -hmm. And that's not very, in many cases, that's very difficult to prove. Right. Mm -hmm. So somebody dies without a will, there's there are rules, there are laws on who gets uh, their assets, correct, Mark? Yes, it's okay. called the laws of intestate succession to die without a will. And it's typically <laughs> spouse, children, parents, and then it kind of goes further out the way in the family tree, correct? Yes. Okay, so somebody drops up, drafts up a will and it's a cranky old man who got in a fight with his adult son and he kicks the son out of the will, but he leaves his other children in the will and he dies, can that son challenge the will? Because he would have got a chunk if there was no will. Or is that, mm -hmm. there's the son out. Well, 
if in that will that that person made, that person made a statement, I intentionally omitted my son, um, absent the other factors of fraud, undue influence, or lack of capacity, they can challenge it, but I do not believe that challenge would be oh. successful. Okay. And you don't have to give reasons. Right. And you don't have to. Don't have to. Okay. Um, a lot of people have questions regarding taxability of estates. And I know there's state tax and there's federal tax. So, Mark, uh, somebody dies, they, uh, you know, th whether they have a will or not, they have so much money. Is there taxes on this stuff? Well, there can be. It's, it's a always ever-changing river. Currently, um, the federal estate tax is still in place, but it has an exemption so large that it rules out a great many people. Each person has a $5,490,000 exemption. So if you've got <coughs> $5.5 million on you, the last 10000 is taxable and that's it. <laughs> yep. and, and if you're married, it's double that. Okay. So almost $11 million. Yep. Minnesota has an estate tax. It maintains its estate tax and it's one of the, what, 17 states left that still do that. Um, and its threshold is $1,800,000 this year per person. Yeah. So sometimes a simple will isn't going to work. I leave all of my assets to my wife. I have a million eight. She has more, or a little more. Now that's a big pile in her name. She dies. The state of Minnesota will come in for its share. Okay. So you have to be tax-wise careful. Okay. The... Um the idea that um, there's taxability means that sometimes people want to give money away before they pass away, at least people that have that kind of money around. Mm -hmm. How do they go about doing that? Uh, well, certainly uh, individuals who have more enough money that they have to worry about paying their, their estate paying estate tax when they die. So most of the times, uh, one quick and ready idea for gifting is taking advantage of the annual um, gift exemption, which means that if you wanted to give $14,000 per year to me, and then another 14,000 to Mark, um, I don't, by the way. But, but that's you <laughs> could. <laughs> um, and, but so you could do that without paying any tax and without incurring any obligation to file a gift tax return. So for many people who want to, to start gifting or start a charitable giving plan, that is the first place that they start because it's so easy to do. So certainly another gifting uh, tool is to make charitable gifts, charitable gifts, which can have um, positive tax consequences depending on what your tax situation is. Sure, sure. You get to write it off on your right. personal mm -hmm. taxes. All right. Now, Mark, a lot of people have items. You know, it's the, <coughs> the cherished fair family heirloom. Uh, and they want to give it to a specific person. Do they do that in a will? Does that affect anything else? You know. Well, they could do it in the will. They could even do it in the trust. Or they could refer to a list that I may make of these cherished items and the person who will receive them upon my death. This is the, I, we call it the transfer by list. And it can either be done through a will if that's your only document or if you have a living trust, it can be done through the living trust. Right. What happens, you know, I'm going to give, you know, I'm going to give all of my baseball cards to my son, and then they get destroyed because they were in the basement in a cardboard box mm -hmm. and the basement flooded. And my, you know, and then you die and the son says, hey, where's the baseball cards? Well, there is no obligation to replace them. Okay. So something like that might have been insured, and it could be a question as to whether they get the insurance money, but my guess is not. And uh, so the, does the person get, well, the, they were worth $10,000, I get $10,000 out of the estate then? Not to my knowledge. Okay. All right. Um, 
somebody dies, there's a will, there's a trust, who makes sure that it all gets followed? That, you know, all of the recommendations or the desires of the person who died, their wishes are followed. Well, one of the most important decisions that people make in their estate planning <laughs> is when they are making a will or when they are creating a trust, they're going to designate a person, a corporation, to serve as a fiduciary who has that responsibility of making sure that the affairs of the estate are wound up in accordance with the will and or the trust. So in a will, that person is called a personal representative and under a trust, uh, that person or corporation is called a trustee. Okay, and can, what if you pick, uh, you know, somebody as your personal representative and then that person predeceases you? Are there secondary uh, You choices? certainly have the legal right to name second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. <laughs> okay. I mean, you c not too many people do that, but you can definitely plan for successors. Okay. What about changes? You know, uh, somebody who's, you mentioned a good uh, gift would be a, a, for an 18 year old is, hey, meet a lawyer and start this process. Now you're 25, now you're 30, now you're 40. How often should somebody change their will or their trust or their list of items? Well, they should look at it as often as they change the oil in their car. And that's a real DYI event. Keeping a file at home where changes occur you change brokerage companies, you change IRA providers, you buy a new life insurance policy. All those are changes that you can monitor and at a certain point, it may be time to make an amendment or consolidate assets and do something like that. But that's perfectly DYI at home every year. And in some cases, talking with the family about it. And that doesn't mean you have to go see your lawyer every nope. year, um, but it does mean take a look. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good, just like an annual checkup. Yeah. Yep. Annual will checkup. Okay. All right, another caller. Um, money was left to a person in a will, but nobody ever found out until much later, which I assume means the will was found later. Um, now the money's gone. What do you do? You know, um, something about that question, um, if the money was owned by that person alone during their lifetime, depending on the amount, but let's say it was $100,000, nobody else would have had access to that money without going through court to probate the estate. So when they say, they left money in a will, but all the money's gone. That suggests to me that perhaps the money was given to a beneficiary instead or given to a joint owner instead. Mm -hmm. okay. But it might be just too late in that circumstance. Yeah. Okay, we only have a couple of minutes left, uh, so some real quick answers. Brother-in-law took sister's name off of the will without her permission. Is that okay? I assume that's okay. It was his will. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, he can do that. Why would she be on it? Um, yeah. Um, my husband died. Am I responsible for his medical bills? Another caller. Well, I assume it, let's assume it's the medical bills of his last, you know, mm -hmm. his last illness. Okay. Versus old, old medical bills. Okay. <laughs> so, in an estate, um, a personal representative is not going to be personally responsible for those bills. However, if the husband dies and he has those assets, those bills are going to be required to be paid from those assets. So at least in that sense, in the estate planning sense, yes. Okay. So the husband's assets. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if there's life insurance money, that's not the husband's assets, that's the... Her Her, her assets. Okay. Um, I own property, I want to leave it to my son. Is it really complicated to do that in a will? Well, you can, you can do it in a will. You can also do it by what's called a transfer on death deed. It's almost like a joint account, but you maintain full ownership and responsibility until you die. And then the deed properly done, the property becomes 
the sons. Okay. A couple other uh, quick questions. A person has uh, Alzheimer's or dementia or something like that. Can they still make a will? Is that too vague of a question? Well, oh. yes, maybe. Okay. Um, a person has to have um, an understanding of who their heirs are and what they own. They don't have to have the same level of competency to run a business or practice law, for example. Um, but somebody with Alzheimer's, most of the time, the answer is probably they can't. Um, but, but if that particular person has, say, for example, in the morning, they can function quite well and are very clear about the decisions that they make. That will can be signed in the morning, even though that person later in the day would not have the competency. Okay. All right. Mark, how often should people discuss their estate planning with their children or their grandchildren? I shouldn't say how often should they discuss it is the Frank, better question. from my experience, they haven't and don't very much, but I think it is a topic for family discussions as you go along, especially if there are provisions in the documents that may cause some upset, which you may not be able to prevent anyway. But they should discuss and be open with their children. Here's who my accountant is, my lawyer. Here's what we've done. Here's why we did it. Um, I'd like to hear from you about it. They just don't do that. Okay. All right. Well, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. So join us next week, which is our last week of the year, when we will answer your questions about what to do if you're injured in a motor vehicle accident. I want to thank our panelists this evening and thank you for watching. I'm Sean Quinn. Good night.